Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be back with you, and we are in the final chapter of the book of Proverbs. Bet you never thought we would get here. We are in Proverbs chapter 31 and beginning this morning in verse 6. And I have, I turned into Stephanie 6 through 18. And then I thought, as I'm driving down to Dallas, who am I kidding? We'll never get to 18, so uh, I'll just read to verse 17 and we'll just go as far as we can go this morning. Uh, we are finishing up uh, this man Lemuel and the counsel that his mother gave him. We ended last time uh, by going through verse 6. Actually, verse 6 and 7 are tied together. So uh, I will briefly touch upon again verse 6 and then move on to verse 7. Give intoxicants to those who are perishing, wine to those who are bitter. A very difficult, uh, 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 very difficult interpretation of this text. Lots of tension here, and uh, that's my job to smooth out the tension. Verse seven: Let them drink and forget their poverty, and remember no more their misery. Verses eight and nine: Open your mouth. To, for the mute, to give judgments for everyone fading away. And finally, his last policy here, uh, open your mouth, judge righteously, issue edicts for the poor and the needy. So what we actually had in the first five verses was addressing this young uh, king, Lemuel, his character, his own personal conduct, and now beginning in verse 6 through 9, we have, this is the policy, uh, the wise pu public policy that he was to uh, rule and judge over a people. Now, beginning in verse 10, we have the final section of the book of Proverbs. This is what all of you ladies have been waiting for. It is the one section of Holy Scripture that my wife dreads, uh, the virtuous woman. Beginning in verse 10, a valiant wife who can find. Her prize is beyond quarrels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. He does not lack spoil. I'll explain that word. It's an interesting word. There's so many interesting words here. Verse 12, She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. With her palms or hands. Actually, the literal word is the palm. With her palm, she selects diligently wood and flax. 14. She becomes like, now there's your simile, that's a comparison. She becomes like a trading vessel. She brings her food from afar. Verse 15. And she arises while it is still in the night and provides for her household the quota, or your, your translation may have portions, to her servant girls. 16. She considers a field and purchases it from the fruit of her palms or hands. She plants a vineyard. 17. She girds her loins with strength. She, 
Now this sounds rather reductant, but this is uh, how the, the inspired language reads. She girds her loins with strength. She strengthens her arms for the task. Now we wouldn't in English read it that way, but I try to be as literal as possible to the inspired text. So that is uh, the word strength used twice in one sentence. And I hope that that gives much more clarity. Well, here is our exposition, uh, ending with the counsel to policy for King Lemuel, Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 6, and then beginning the virtuous woman. 6 and 7, as I said, are connected. Uh, verse 6, you may have bitter distress. The King James translates it heavy heart. The lexicon translates this bitter of soul. So think of any way that you could possibly be deprived in spirit. That's the idea of the word. So it's an emotional state. That's what's going on here. Now, two things. First, verse 6 is a command. It's a softer command that we had earlier, and that creates part of the tension that needs to be resolved. Look at this verb in verse 6, to give. It's understood differently from the strong command that his mother previously has given him. Uh, how do we know that for sure? Because it's completely out of harmony, or it creates a tension from the wisdom that she had already given. Now, what's the wisdom that she already gave? Well, that's found in verse 4. Not for kings to drink wine, for rulers to crave strong drink. So, you have this contradiction, seeming contradiction. What is the policy? Uh, verse 7 defines the people as grinding away in poverty to drown them in strong drink. Would that be wisdom? Would that be skill for living? Uh, no, it couldn't be. Uh, so, we have to resolve the tension. Uh, look at these two words, perishing, meaning dying, often used of devastating and destructive ends that God inflicts upon the wicked. So, let's look at the parallels of verse 7. The top line, forgets, matches line 2, remember no more. Line 1, poverty. Line two, misery, or literally heavy toil. So how do we understand these two verses that are tied together? And the, the interpretation that makes the most sense of any and all, and you can imagine how many there could possibly be, is that this is sarcasm. That his mother was explaining a policy and reasoning out as sarcastically. What do you do with the poor of the land? Do you just leave them? Do you just let them be in their squalor? You look at the great cities of the United States of America today. They're becoming tent cities. Poverty tents on the streets. What have we done in public policy? We have left the people that way. And that's exactly the opposite of the public policy that this wise mother was teaching her son. I go on. Do we just at government cost pass out strong drink and let them lie in the squalor? till their death? No. 
What have we learned from kings all throughout this book? First of all, kings are the ideal king. There's never wicked kings mentioned here. It's always the wise king and the wise king's policy. What's the job of a wise king? Well, all through the Proverbs, he above all people is to care for the poor, for the weak, and to protect them. The real job of a king is to get them out of their state of misery, if at all possible. What we have done in America is we felt sorry for them in public policy. And we have taken uh, tax dollars and we have enabled them to live like this. That is contrary to the Word of God. And here it is. Show people. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 6, 7, and 8 and 9 as well. See, here in 8 and 9, we are to enact public decrees to protect these people. But how do we go about protecting them? By leaving them? No. By bringing them up and out of in every way possible. That's the job of a king and a leader. We have done in public policy no goodness or kindness to an American citizen that is allowed to be on the government dole, doesn't have to work, have children on the government dole. That is not wise policy, according to the book of Proverbs, if you believe the Scriptures. Here is 8 and 9 explained. This opening verse, look at the command. Open your mouth. In other words, speak up giving good and righteous judgments. And now an explanation. For the weak, they have no voice. Those who are fading away. Now trust me, I've been with the wise, the careful, and the shrewd in business. Let me tell you how they are. They take care of themselves first. I mean, they get theirs up front going in. And they eliminate as much risk as possible for themselves. I know. I've been on their side of the table. When I tried to speak up for consultants that helped us navigate through difficult times, never mind them. That's the way it is. I didn't have enough stroke. And, but I did speak up. I opened my mouth. The, the powerful, the smart, the shrewd, the careful, they take care of themselves. That's why you needed a strong king. This word judgment further defines us in verse 9. Righteous judgment. Those who are considered socially uh, unacceptable. They have no power. They have no respect in a king's court. What are you doing here in your blue uniform or your blue jeans? Everybody here is covered in royalty. That's the idea. But the king must make himself by policy, acceptable to the common people. That is policy from the Bible. Now, our president, he walks with an entire phalanx of smart-looking, younger, guarded people looking for weapons in every corner, and he's surrounded by them. The wise king, the wise ruler, the wise leader in authority, what does he do? He presses the flesh. 
In the previous administration of the United States of America, I saw something that I had really never seen before of a president. Now, he's a president. He's not a candidate running. He's a president. And we had a hurricane in Florida. And the previous president of the United States had a ball cap on and he was in a line handing out water. Now, I know it was all set up for the press, and I'm sure it didn't last very long. But the point is, you saw it. It was an image. And an image today, and this time, is very important. That's wisdom. How do I know that? Do you remember when they brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem? 2 Samuel. Where was David? Was he ruling from his throne? Was he sitting up there with his crown and a parade reviewed by? No. Where was he? He was dancing in worship before the ark. He was teaching the people this is how we treat the Lord. We worship before Him. And I, even though I am king, I am one of you. How did he prove he was one of them? Because afterwards, they passed out fig cakes. And some of them got fig cakes from the hand of the greatest king in human history. David. That's wisdom. That's great public policy. So when you see these men, and everything is thought through, and everything is staged, of course, but when you see them get out and press the flesh with the crowd, with the people, know that that is the wisdom that was taught in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. Don't hide behind your bulletproof glass all your days. Get out and press the flesh with people. That is the strong king who is in front of the people. The great king, the wise king, is the man who is accountable to the Lord his God. When David sinned, he fell to his knees accountable to God for what he had perpetrated. Adultery, murder himself. Let's face it. These billionaires are oligarchs in our society. They can go and they can do what they want, when they want. They can buy anything and everything. We are seeing wealth like we have never seen it before in America. But the wise man is the man who holds himself accountable to the Lord his God. That is true wisdom. We are ending the kings. This is our last time to talk about kings from the book of Proverbs. So let me close talking about kings for a moment. Those who have rule and those who have power and authority in the freedoms of our land. We are coming up to an election next time around. Would you pray with me that God in His grace would put the right man on the position of power and authority? My friends, the president is one personality 
Here's what you need to know and realize. It is his cabinet. The people around him. They are the most powerful people that the government has given us. They have their own kingdom. The head of transportation. The secretary of state. The one who gives us energy policy, etc. Don't you realize there's not a manual that the president pulls out and says, this is your manual for energy. This is your manual for relations in governments of the world. No. What is policy? Policy is the people he chooses. Ask yourself, who does he choose? They are a reflection of him. That's the policy. That person. That personality. What are they like? It's not in the book of Proverbs that we would pray for a righteous king. That's never in the book. What is in the book? Here it is. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is destruction of a nation. Look at us. Look at us as a free people, as a society. We're awash in money and corruption. It's everywhere. It's people are bought and they're bought with profits. To my surprise, to my shock, one of my great heroes in American history is Sam Rayburn of Texas. Democrat. I was reading the first volume of Lyndon Johnson's biography by Robert Caro. I came to the chapter on Gentleman Sam, Sam Rayburn of Texas. And I thought, well, I'm going down into the pit of the darkest part of hell now. <laughs> and to my surprise, with every page I turned, I was shocked. Here's what you need to know about Sam Rayburn. If you drive out of Dallas and go north, you have Sam Rayburn Toll Road. I salute it every time. <laughs> you could not buy Sam Rayburn lunch. You could not buy Sam Rayburn a ticket on a train to go back to Texas. If Sam Rayburn ever perceived that you were buying something for him to influence him, here's Carl's description. He turned scarlet red, he waved his finger in your face, and you were through in Washington. Don't ever try to get a job, don't ever try to get through to anybody or reach anybody's door. It didn't take long for the general public to figure that out. That's what made Sam Rayburn such a powerful man. So interesting how societies and cultures changed. It was actually the Republicans. They were the country club. They were the elitists. They were the lawyers from Harvard and Yale. They would come before Sam Rayburn in his committee. Their carefully typed presentation, and he would kindly nod, thank them, and then do what he wanted to do. Sam Rayburn brought Electric, electrication, electrocution, uh, power generation to the state of Texas. We weren't anybody to be thought about. 
back in his day and time. Here was a man whose father was a farmer. And Sam Rayburn told the story when he went off to college that his father, in dirty overalls, stood on the platform as his son was catching the train and he reached into his front top pocket on his overalls and he pulled out a one. And he pulled out another one. And another one. Wadded up. Stained by sweat. Thirteen ones. And he sent his boy off to school. Robert Caro said, Sam Rayburn told that story often in his life and he never could tell it without crying. That's what's wrong with America. We're bought. We're bought by anybody and everything. And the only hope for our country is regeneration. Men must be born from above so that they will not be bought. That's the truth. That's the reality. There is no hope for us as a country as long as men can be bought. But you get a Christian, a regenerated man, in a position of power that cannot be bought that turns down the comforts and the riches of life. And you follow that man because God will use him powerfully. And we need many, many of them in our country today. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any land. We're through with the kings. The final section of the book of Proverbs. The valiant wife. Let me begin by addressing the literature, some of the details, an interpretation, and then finally a perspective. First, the literature. It is written in an acrostic form. Meaning, verse 10 opens with an A in the inspired language. Verse 11 is a B. Telling us two things when we have an acrostic. First of all, this wasn't written like many of the country and western songs. I wrote it in 15 minutes and it was a bestseller. I wrote it on the back of a brown paper sack. No. Not this. This was carefully thought through and contemplated. That's an acrostic. This piece put together much forethought and consideration. Here's second. The acrostic connects to the Hebrew alphabet, which basically tells us that this is the wise woman from A to Z. Here she is. In all of the presentation of Holy Scripture, here she is. There is nothing beautiful about her. The only mention of beauty in this particular chapter is... To dismiss it. Beauty fades. It goes away. We have become a culture of worship of looks. Looks mean everything. But not according to the Proverbs. They're so discounted that they aren't even mentioned. That's phenomenal to me. Let's address the details for a moment. We begin in verse 10 with the blessing of her husband. 
the praise of her. Verse 10, he praises her, and let's observe the catch words that we have in this carefully worded, carefully thought through piece. Verse 10, you have wife. Verse 30, you have wife. The word valiant, verse 10 and verse 29. Husband, verse 11, verse 29. Let me give you the interpretation of this entire section. I just wrote these down as a one-word summary describing this woman for us. Rare, precious, trustworthy, energetic, resourceful, strong, prosperous, kind, disciplined. That pretty much summarizes all you ladies in this room. I got it. It should be noted that there are many interpretations of this literature. Suffice to say, there is no one individual in mind in all of Holy Scripture. No. What this is, is a com composite of the regenerative power of God working in the life of one woman. Refracted by the power of God, we might say. So here she is. This is what she brings. This is her life. Blessed is the man whose wife knows Jesus Christ as, his, as her personal Savior because she has been saved from her natural nature to become a wise woman, a woman of skill. Let me say something about perspective. This section actually closes the book. So let's get perspective on that. What have we had throughout the entire book? We've had the leadership of the father to the son in the home. The man of the house has been in the lead. Now, at the end, we are given full view of His Helper. Here's the way the wise father was able to pull it off. Through His Helper, through His wife. May she be praised. That's what the book says. May she be praised. Let's get real practical. What are you doing, gentlemen, to praise your wife? What are you doing to praise her? It's very interesting if you read below the surface of the spiritual life as it's presented to us consistently in the New Testament. Man is the leader. The buck stops with him. Being the leader, he is the initiator. Let's just think about that for a moment. For example, our Lord Jesus says, Give, and it will be given back to you. The Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, cast your bread upon the water, and it'll come back to you. Man is the initiator. And as a result, the blessings flow back to him. What are you doing to praise your wife? What are you doing to praise your wife? What are the practical things that you're doing every week 
week in, week out, to praise your wife. The Lord took me down many times over this very thought. But here's little practical things that I do. Periodically bring her flowers. I hate florists. Gosh, I hate to even go in there. But you know what? I do it. I fill up my wife's car. I don't want her out in the cold, and I don't want her out in the heat, and I don't want her out in the filling station. So I keep her car topped off, filled up. Little things. What little things can you do to show your wife how valuable she is to you? That is this interpretation. She gives you perspective from this book. She is to be admired. She is to be treasured. She is the valiant wife. Here's verse 10. A valiant wife who can find her value is more than jewels or rubies. We open the final section with this immediate subject right here. The valiant wife. What is the word valiant? Well, it means strength. Here's where it's found. Psalm 84 and verse 5. Blessed is the man, and here's our word, strength. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Now let me tell you something very neat about this word, strength. It occurs in 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 14. And here's where it is so interesting. When Nebuchadnezzar carried off the southern kingdom into Babylon, he took all of the strong men and women. He took all the officials. He took basically everybody that mattered. He would leave a mummy dummy like me to squalor in the land. He took the best. They were a specific class. How were they described? By strength. That's your word. This is a subclass of a class of people. This is a very unique woman. And so the question is, who can find? Matching beyond jewels and rubies. How do you assess the value of your wife? Well, let's just do it this way. Believer's Chapel, under the leadership of the elders that we have, is a very reformed type church, particularly reformed, strong in its soteriology. You don't stay here very long without getting the soteriology of this book explained to you over and over. That's the leadership of this church. Well, what does the sovereignty of God teach us about the relationship with this man and this woman? Go back to the garden. God put him to sleep, and he brought the woman to him. That's the sovereignty of God. God has created a person to match you to make you complete. Sovereignty, remember? Let's apply it. The sovereignty of God. Not random. This is what He produced, gentlemen, in your life to make you whole and complete. I was listening to Martin Lloyd-Jones preaching 50 years ago. 
the other night. He was, uh, had already uh, given up the pastorate at Westminster, and for the next decade or so, he would be an itinerant preacher all over the world. He tells a story about taking, I love this, a motor car, he said. I took a motor car uh, out, way out into the boonies, long distance away from London. And they had prepared for him a house for him to stay in. It was a very prominent man of the little community. He taught that night, and the next morning he got up, had breakfast with the family, and Martin Lloyd-Jones noticed the cabinet and the china in the cabinet across the table. He kept looking at it. Very bright, beautiful. He got up and he walked to the cabinet itself, and the proprietor, the man of the house, said, are you interested in the china? He said, yes, I know nothing of china. Yeah, but it looks very exquisite, very beautiful. He said, well, let me tell you about it. And he opened the drawer, he got out his gloves, he got a key, he opened the cabinet, and he very carefully put down the pieces of china on the table. He said, are you familiar with this china? No, said Lloyd-Jones. He said, well, it's called Swazi China. It was only made for three years, from 1815 to 1818. The company went out of business. It was kind of like the DeLorean. You made it, and it was so expensive, you couldn't create a market for it because no one could afford it. And thus, they only lasted three years. Well, think about that. 1818 was the last year. This was in the 1960s. Think of all the pieces that had been lost or broken. Now this Swazi China is of such value. He said, I've been offered $1,400 a plate. Then he walks over with his gloves and he pulls out a little tiny book and he opens the book, and of course, it had been marked for the exact page. He opens it up, and there is the picture of the china that is set before Martin Lloyd-Jones on this table. Each piece had been registered, and had been registered back in this book, and to this man's name. But the thing that was the real zinger, said Lloyd-Jones, was across the page, there was the Queen of England. She had the Swazi China, too. That's what you call rare. That's what you call valuable. Gentlemen, that's your wife. Now, I sit and talk to you all the time. I got 30 men in a Friday morning Bible study. I got a lot more that drift in and out of my life. And here's what you hear. Well, my wife, she's not very responsive to me. Okay? How do you treat your wife? Well, I, no. I, I want to know for you to answer my question. How do you treat your wife? Do you treat her like Swazi China? Do you put the gloves on before you handle it? Look what we have done to marriage. We have made it common. Like a garbage can. How do you treat your wife? And a better question, what are you going to do about it? Do you hear the Word of God? Do you hear what it's saying to you? You're the initiator. You're the leader. 
Lovers or leaders, are you leading? How are you leading? You want confident children? Don't we all? Here's how you have confident children. You love your wife and you let your children see how you love your wife. And believe me, you will build an EIQ. EIQ. Emotional IQ. You will build stability and character. And there will not be people that are blown by every wind of doctrine. No, their heads will be tied on to their body and thinking straight. That's what you will teach your children. I beat my son over the head all the time. You want your daughter to marry the right man? Let me tell you who she's going to marry. I've already got it figured out. She's going to marry someone just like you. And when the father's not home, what are they doing? They're groping in the dark, emotional, looking for what they think they need. And that's what you have a generation of. Fatherless women with men. Love your wife. Time to close. But I'm not closing. I want to talk to you men right here. What are you going to do in the next seven days to show your wife how much you value her? How much you care for her? What course correction can you make starting today under the Word of God to become wise in your life? Oh, my friends, we just scratched the surface. I'm not through with you yet, dads. I'm not through by a long shot. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Uh, bless the men that are here. Give them ears to hear and respond to the Word of God. Bless these valiant wives. Strengthen them all the more. Thank you for them. They are precious in our families and to us. Bless our children and our grandchildren and those that today you and I can have great influence upon. Lord, would you bless to that end. And we ask this all in the powerful name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.